But in America today, we have exactly the same situation. We have people who are accepting that we have freedom of worship rather than freedom of religion. And what our founding fathers gave us was freedom of religion, not freedom of worship, freedom of religion, which means we can worship, but we can also take our, our faith and our values and we can talk about it, we can live it, we can use it to influence our culture and our society. Mid-South Viewpoint, a Christian news and information feature of Bot Radio Network 640 AM, discussing the news, views, issues, and concerns that affect our community. Join us now for today's edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. Hi, and welcome to Mid-South Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler. Pleasure to have you here on this edition of our program. Today, we welcome retired Lieutenant General William Boykin to the broadcast. We want to, first of all, thank you for taking time with Bot Radio Network today, sharing about your upcoming visit to Memphis. We're going to be explaining a lot of the details about your coming on September 19th at Bellevue Baptist Church for an event called a Threat Briefing. Now, before we start getting into that conversation, I would like to let our listeners know that you are one of the original members of the U.S. Army's Delta Force. Also, you commanded Green Berets and led military teams into combat into Iraq and served as Deputy Director of Activities for the CIA and also functioned as a counterterrorism expert for President George W. Bush. I understand the last four years of your 36-year career Career, were served as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Before we go any further, Lieutenant General William Boykin, can I just say thank you, sir, for your sacrifice and your service for the protection of our freedoms and country here in the United States. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a real honor to be able to serve my country. Currently, you are serving as Family Research Council's Executive Vice President with the responsibility for overseeing the day-to-day operations, and there's a lot of underscore to that. We won't go into everything right now, but we do want to welcome you and talk about your coming. You and your wife, Ashley, have five children, and you have a growing number of grandchildren. We do, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that we're here uh, at the Family Research Council, and that uh, we returned to Washington after having retired and moved away, is because of those grandchildren and and our really strong desire to make a difference in uh, in their future. And we don't think that there is any place that we can make a better contribution than right here with some great Christians and great Americans in the Family Research Council. We were praying just before going on the air, and our world is in a turmoil. There's crises that are breaking out all over the world. What do you see as our greatest unseen threat, and who is our greatest enemy that we face today? Well, I think the greatest unseen threat is apathy among the American population. I think that these people make no effort to know what's going on in our country and in our society and in the world that we live in are very dangerous people because they vote because they have no idea what's happening, and and they vote without the benefit of having an understanding of who they're voting for, what they're voting for. And as a result of that, I think that they are the the greatest real threat to uh, the long-term security of America. We have several emerging threats. You don't have to look very far to see The conflict in Israel is a huge threat to U.S. national security, that uh, ISIS or the Islamic State and its activities that are going on in Iraq now are a huge threat. Iran with its nuclear program, North Korea with its nuclear program, as well as its attitude of expansion, and then just simply look at Russia and the Ukraine and all of the things that are happening in North Africa and Syria, the world is in absolute chaos. All of these things, because of globalization, are future security threats or to you know the United States. But unfortunately, the biggest threat is those people in America that are clueless as to what's going on in the world. I don't know the intelligence here, but I did see on a political post website this morning stating that ISIS found the weapons of mass destruction that were hidden by Saddam Hussein. Did you hear that news? You know, I have heard that, but I don't uh, don't necessarily accept its accuracy at this point. But yes, I did hear something similar to that. And remember also 
that, to his credit, Bush played this the right way. We did find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We did not find what the national intelligence estimates said was there, but we did find weapons of mass destruction. We found the same chemical weapons that he used to kill 30,000 Kurds back after the first Gulf War. He had large stockpiles of those. Those are weapons of mass destruction. But Bush was not willing to accept credit for having found them when he said, that's not what was in the national intelligence estimate, so we're not going to make a big issue of that. But uh, there were weapons of mass destruction there. What did you find most satisfying about your long military career? I think it was the people that I served with. Uh, Every day you get up and you're surrounded by very committed patriots that love America, that are, you know, they are courageous, they're committed, and it just makes you feel good to be around these kind of people. So that was my probably the greatest privilege I had serving in the military. What about your greatest disappointment? My greatest disappointment probably was in leadership. Uh, I was greatly disappointed with Richard Nixon when he lied to the American public with Bill Clinton when he was involved with Monica Lewinsky and and Jimmy Carter when he was just so absolutely feckless and ineffective at foreign policy and really in most of the things that he was involved in. Those were huge disappointments because those men were the commander-in-chief, and you want to respect and admire the the person who you ultimately uh, report to and under whose authority you serve. And And those were huge disappointments to me. What are some lessons that you've learned when it comes to dealing with your enemy? First of all, know your enemy. You know, uh, Sun Tzu, the great Chinese philosopher, said, know your enemy, know yourself. You need not fear a hundred battles. Know your enemy. You must know what motivates him. You must know what his tactics, techniques, and procedures are. You must know why he does what he does. Now, there's a problem, and that is that As Americans today, we don't understand our enemies. We don't understand that radical Islam is a true enemy because it subscribes to a 1,400-year-old theology that says that they're compelled to kill us. That makes the threat of radical jihad even more serious because we don't recognize it. So that's the first thing. Know your enemy. Recognize who you're up against and what makes them tick. And then the second thing is, Never let your guard down. Never take for granted the the seriousness of the threat. And we've also done that as a nation. We've had these periods where we've won great victories and we just went into lethargic, apathetic periods where we said, well, the threat is gone, we won that war, and and then what we wind up seeing happen is the same thing that happened on 9-11. You are attacked out of nowhere because you've let your guard down, you've become weak, and the enemy exploits that and takes advantage of it. And remember that, you know, our enemy, Satan, walketh about like a roaring lion looking for whom he might devour. We should never forget the spiritual dimension of the threats to America today. Of course, we have those outside threats, but those internal threats in our country among our own people, as we see exampled in Ferguson and things are happening there right now. Would you care to comment about that? Well, I, first of all, I... I don't know enough about what happened in Ferguson to pass judgment on this thing, but this is, I mean, my sentiments are this. There's a lot of outside interference in this. There are people that are exploiting this. I mean, there are people coming in from other states just so they can loot and pillage. And I wish that the race baiters like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton would just stay out of it. I also think this is a state issue. I think they need to let the governor and and his staff and those that are accountable to him, they need to let them deal with this. This is not a federal issue. Uh, And the third thing is, I don't understand what the demonstrators want. They want justice? Well, what? we have a legal system. What, do you want to usurp that and go out and lynch the guy that did the shooting? That would seem to be a dual message there. We want justice, uh, you know, on the one hand, and on the other hand, lynch him. It's just an inconsistent message. But again, there's so much confusion now. I don't think, I think a lot of those people there in Ferguson are not even sure why they're out there. But I will say this as a final thing. I hope that justice is done, but I'm not ready to condemn the policeman that did the shooting until I know the facts. 
But I think that a lot of this is what you're seeing is frustration because there's no jobs in the black community. And this president has done absolutely nothing to help with the job situation in the black community. And I think a lot of what you're seeing is their frustration coming out as a result of the continued decline of the job situation in, in their communities. Back to the threat briefing that is bringing you to Memphis. Uh, how often do you lead these type of briefings like the one you're coming to Memphis on September 19th to do? About once a quarter. We have these kind of things. As a matter of fact, I'll be in Boston on the uh, 9th of September. So just 10 days before we get there, I'll be there with uh, Alan West and Tom McInerney from Fox News and some others uh, to talk about the uh, security of Israel and the impact that that has on U.S. security. So uh, we do these uh, at least once a quarter uh, in different places to try and raise people's awareness of the details of what's going on. A lot of people hear bits and pieces, but we, we try to fill in the gaps there and let them know uh, exactly what is occurring and, and around the world in these different places. What have you found to be the greatest vulnerability where churches are the least prepared? Well, unfortunately, churches don't talk about spiritual warfare a whole lot anymore. I'm not afraid to tell you that I believe that when the Bible talks about putting on the whole armor of God and talks about our enemy being Satan, that it is it's not metaphoric. It is absolutely a directive that we should put on the whole armor of God, that we should recognize that, you know, spiritual warfare is very real. The same Bible that tells us about God tells us about Satan. And unfortunately, most of the churches think that that is that's depressing and they shouldn't talk about it. And, well, I think that churches are called to preach the whole gospel, not just what they feel comfortable with, but the whole gospel. And the whole gospel includes the notion that and the understanding that uh, our enemy is a spiritual enemy as much as it is a physical enemy. And you talk real specific, too, about persecution. As Christ said, there will be times of persecution for the church. And we're seeing it unfold now. Globally, you're seeing uh, unprecedented levels of uh, persecution of Christians, and that's what's happening in uh, in Iraq right now, as ISIS is moving to kill as many Christians as they can. And But they're being persecuted all over the globe, especially in these Islamic countries. The Christians are dying at over 100,000 a year, dying for their faith. But in Luke 21, Jesus said, when his disciples asked him what were the signs of his return, and we all know the wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and great pestilences and so forth. But he also said, but before all this, the end is not yet. Before all this, they'll take you before kings and rulers, and they will persecute you all on the account of me. That persecution is occurring right here at home, right here in America, as Christians are being persecuted in every way imaginable. But the other thing that he went on to say as he was talking to his disciples was, but this will be an opportunity for you to be a witness for me. In other words, we as Christians should recognize that as we're persecuted, it's an opportunity for us to, to be witnesses for Christ, and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that persecution that we're seeing today, you look at things like health care, Embedded in health care is payments for abortion. It is payments for abortifacient drugs that are essentially just that. They abort the fetus. Look at all kinds of things that are happening in America today that is direct persecution of Christians. Now, what they're trying to do is exactly what Hitler did. What they're trying to do is drive us underground. You see, Hitler drove the church underground. He went to the church, and he said, you can have your sermons, you can worship inside your church, but keep it in the church. Don't bring it on the streets of Germany, or I'll crush you, because I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and you're not going to interfere. And then the church went silent. The church accepted that they could worship in their church, but they could not bring their faith into the public square, with the exception of a very famous man named Bonhoeffer who stood up to Hitler and gave his life as a result of it. But in America today, we have exactly the same situation. 
we have people who are accepting that we have freedom of worship rather than freedom of religion. And what our founding fathers gave us was freedom of religion, not freedom of worship, freedom of religion, which means we can worship, but we can also take our, our faith and our values and we can talk about it, we can live it, we can use it to influence our culture and our society. General, I had the opportunity to visit with Education Director for Russia, Dr. Luzinko, who is now a follower of Christ. But after the fall of communism and the walls came down, there was this moral vacuum that took place in Russia, a large amount of suicides and alcoholism and teen pregnancies and all these moral decay things happening in great numbers. She was appointed by the government to find some education material to be able to offset this crisis. And so after much research with her staff, she discovered that 70 years prior to the revolution that the Bible was a book that was favored by many Russians and people lived by scripture teachings. So it was through that study that she herself became a believer in Jesus Christ and was able to implement a program to teach the Bible in the Russian schools. You can look back at our country and see where we have gotten away from the Word of God. We have indeed, and it is is just destroying us as a society. Again, it goes back to this issue. As Christians, are we going to exercise to the full extent our constitutional rights? Are we going to do what God has commanded us to do, which is to go into all the nations, making disciples of all nations. Well, that starts at home. Too many people in the church, too many Christians are passive. Too many Christians are afraid. They live in fear. Too many Christians are worried about what the media is going to say about them or what a neighbor is going to say or what the boss is going to say. And they're not concerned enough about what God's going to say the day they stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. And that is where we have to change our focus to recognizing that this country was built by godly men that had a vision that was divine, that was given to them by God to establish a nation where the consent of the governed and unalienable rights would be two of the founding principles. What are some things that you'll be sharing as you educate churches about being wise and aware, but at the same time balancing that where our places of worship don't become a military base. I mean, you're not suggesting that we take up arms. No, absolutely not. I'm I'm suggesting that we take on the whole armor of God. I'm not suggesting that everybody go home and grab their AR-15 and get in the street. Quite the contrary. I think that would be foolish, it would be disastrous, and and, and quite frankly, just silly. In general, I say that because I have seen even recent posts on Facebook, comments similar to that, and it's very disturbing. It is disturbing, and I get it all the time in in my post in response to the posts that I make on Facebook and other things, where people are talking about armed revolution. And I say, our founding fathers, who were godly men, gave us everything we need to right the wrongs in this country today, all you have to have is the courage to exercise your rights. And when you, for example, when you don't even vote, which a large percentage of our population doesn't, but you can't complain. You can't talk about changing America if you don't even exercise the most fundamental rights you have and then get involved in the process. Uh, get in behind candidates. Uh, put your money and your time. Volunteer in their campaigns and press people into service or run yourself. And, you know, that's not just for president or senator. That's for the school board. That's for the city council. But there's so much that people are just not doing, and out of frustration, they're talking about armed revolution, and it is absolutely nonsense. What are you going to go up against? And do you really think that you could? I mean, look, change the direction of America by changing the leadership of this country. I think you make a great point. I know Israel was commanded to take possession of the land, and I think that involves us not being complacent. Use the word apathetic at the beginning of our talk here, and I think we have so easily become so apathetic. We absolutely have, and I'm not sure what a dominionist is, but I'm not one, but I do believe that what God has called us to do is to make every effort that we can to defend this nation, to make it better, to help it to prosper. In fact, in Jeremiah 29, 7, he says, Seek the peace 
and prosperity of the nation in which I have placed you. Pray that it will profit, for if it profits, you too shall profit. That's two commands. One is seek the peace and prosperity. That means working on behalf of it. And the second command was pray. And we need to be praying for America. But uh, so many Americans just, again, they don't know what's going on. And those that do know what's going on, many of them are afraid to stand up and, and be counted when it comes to trying to change the direction. General Boykin, you are associated with the Security Association of Christian Organizations, which, by the way, is sponsoring the event, bringing you here to Memphis on September 19th, 7 o'clock at Bellevue Baptist Church. There is no cost for this event. Can you tell us a little about this Security Association of Christian Organizations? Yeah, well, I think that what has occurred is that there's been a greater realization that The threat against not only uh, Christians out in the public square, but but Christians, people of faith, inside, you know, their churches and their places of worship has grown substantially. The threat against missionaries as they travel into these very dark places around the world has grown substantially. And and really, the, the idea behind this alliance, if you will, is to try and help prepare churches, uh, pastors, missionaries and other ministry uh, organizations to uh, take a realistic view of of the threat and then be able to defend themselves against that threat. And much of it is preemptive. In other words, it's making sure you're doing all the right things to uh, reduce your vulnerability or reduce the threat to you. Well, are there certain people in the congregation that need the special training in the event of an unwanted attack or a situation that could possibly arise? Look, I, every church that I speak in around the country, and I speak all over the country, has uh, people that are armed now in the in those congregations. I, I don't know the last time I was at a church where they didn't have uh, someone armed in that congregation, and that is because, look, I, I work at the Family Research Council. Two years ago, on the 15th of August, a man walked in the lobby of the Family Research Council right downtown Washington. We're a Christian organization. A man named Floyd Lee Corkins walked in with a 9 millimeter pistol and 100 rounds of ammunition and shot Leo Johnson, our building manager, and he did so because he was going to kill as many of us as possible because we were listed as a hate group because we've taken a stand on natural marriage in support of natural marriage. And he was going to kill as many of us as possible. Churches are confronted with the same exact thing. Churches have the same threat against them. Ministries have the same threat. This this threat is manifesting in some very evil physical behavior. General Boykin, at what point in your life were you assured that Jesus Christ was who he said he was and that he really wanted an eternal relationship with you? When I was uh, 22 years old, at Fort Benning, Georgia, as a uh, brand new second lieutenant, uh, as I, having grown up in the church, I uh, realized that I knew what the gospel was. I realized that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the uh, the Son of God, that he died and arose for my sins, but I had been running from him all my life. And as a young lieutenant at Fort Benning, Georgia, the Holy Spirit began to to speak with a still small voice into my life saying, I know I have a plan for you, but it will never be fulfilled until you submit to me. And it was at that moment that I submitted my life to God's authority, repented of my uh, sinful ways and pledged to do the best that I could with his help to make him the Lord of my life and live for him. I've struggled and I still do, but he's never let me go. General, just a couple of more brief questions as we wrap up our program today. What hope do you have for the future of your grandkids and the future generations living in the United States? You know, I'm glad you asked me that because my wife and I were just having this discussion last night. Look, um, I'm really encouraged right now because I'm sensing an awakening. Not exactly like the first and the second great awakening. It's not, a, it's not just a, a revival. You know, an awakening is different. An awakening, you know, may last for 50 years. A, a revival at best is probably a year or two. But I'm, I'm actually sensing an awakening that is resulting from the evil that, that has 
perpetuated uh, and insinuated our society. And I think people are getting disgusted. They're waking up, and this this awakening, I think, will bring us to the point that we will, as a nation, will change directions, will recapture our greatness uh, in American exceptionalism, will come back as a result of this awakening. And finally, sir, what have you enjoyed most about being an American? Everything. I have enjoyed everything. I just have enjoyed the idea that I am free to choose what religion that I want to follow. I'm free to choose what profession. I'm free to choose my friends. I am free to speak about what I believe, at least for now. And that's been, I think, my greatest blessing, being an American. Well, General Boykin, as I mentioned at the beginning of our program, my appreciation, your service to our country. But I want to thank you now for what you're doing for Christ's kingdom to make a difference and to share with churches the passion you have about being wise and about your coming to Memphis on September 19th for this threat briefing. Just real briefly, why is it called a threat briefing? Well, because we want to highlight the fact that there are many things that uh may not be happening right here in America, but they they still impact on our national security, and they are threats to that national security. Of course, you published a book back in 2008 detailing some of the Pentagon's most sensitive operations since the 20th century, including the 1979 hostage crisis in Iran, the 1989 hunt for the Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega, also the Somalia mission that killed 18 U.S. troops that later was seen in the Black Hawk Down movie. You've also written, I think, another book or two. Is that correct? I have written uh, Never Surrender was my autobiography, which is what you're referring to. I've written two novels. And Dr. Stu Weber from Portland, Oregon, and I have just written a book that is about to be published called The Warrior Soul, where we talk about what a warrior really is, and then a finishing up novel with a former Muslim Brotherhood terrorist who is now a believer in Christ, Kamal Saleem, and we're finishing a novel here uh, within the next three weeks. And do you have a website where we can find out more about your travels, about the work that you do? Kingdom Warriors, one word, kingdomwarriors.net. KingdomWarriors.net. Retired Lieutenant General William Boykin, thank you so much for spending time with Bot Radio Network this afternoon. Remind our friends that you will be coming to Bellevue Baptist Church for a free threat briefing seminar September 19th, 7 p.m. For more information on this event, you can go to Bellevue.org. That's Bellevue.org. That's all the time we have on this edition of Mid South Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler. Hey, thanks for listening. Talk to you next time. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Mid-South Viewpoint. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can email us. Our address is wcrv at botradionetwork.com. This has been Mid-South Viewpoint, another Christian news and information feature from Bot Radio Network 640 AM.